Good morning. My name is Dr. Mary Steven. Welcome to the WHO Africa Media Briefing, which is taking place in collaboration with the APO Group. First, some housekeeping. You can listen to the press briefing in either French or English. To do this, please go to the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, click on the globe icon, and select your most preferred language. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue à cette conférence de presse de l'OMS. Si vous souhaitez écouter la conférence en français, merci de bien vouloir cliquer sur l'icône en forme de globe qui est située à droite en bas de l'écran. Et si vous avez des questions, n'oubliez pas de mentionner non seulement votre nom, mais aussi le média que vous vous présentez. Merci. Merci, Asmina. And now joining us from Brazzaville, Congo, is Dr. Mashidisho Moeti the WHO Regional Director for Africa. Dr. Moeti will introduce our panelists. Welcome, Dr. Moeti. Thank you very much, Mary, Madam Moderator. So good afternoon to all the journalists, colleagues who are joining this press conference on the COVID-19 pandemic, where we'll discuss a new WHO community testing initiative that seeks to dramatically improve the case detection rate in participating countries. Donc, bonjour, bon dia et bienvenue à tous nos collègues journalistes. I'm very pleased to be joined for this conversation by Dr. Ali Ngon Tamdu, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of the Dakar Health Region, who will provide an update on how Senegal is taking forward the new initiative. Bienvenue, Dr. Tamdu and Dr. Ngozi Rondu, a senior scholar at the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown University, also joins us to provide insights on the importance of rethinking testing strategies. There have now been more than 8.4 million COVID-19 cases in Africa, and sadly, 214,000 lives have been lost. In the past week, there were 42,000 new cases, a decrease of 35% compared to the previous week. In most countries, cases are trending downwards or plateauing, but a few are still reporting increases, including Angola, Gabon, and Cameroon. With 67 million Africans now fully vaccinated, equal to only 4.9% of the continent's population, hundreds of millions of people remain vulnerable to severe COVID-19 illness and death. 31 countries, have only 2.4% of their populations fully vaccinated. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're by no means near the finishing line for this pandemic. For the end to be in sight, vaccination rates must dramatically increase, case management capacities should be expanded, and basic public health measures, including active case finding and testing, should be reinforced. Throughout the pandemic, Concerns of underdetection and underestimation of the burden of COVID-19 have been raised across all parts of the world. In Africa, with our low vaccination rates, it's vitally important to have a better grasp of where and how the virus is circulating in our communities. As WHO in Africa, we are using a model to estimate the degree of underestimation. Our analysis indicates that as few as one in seven cases is being detected, meaning that the true COVID-19 burden in Africa could be around 59 million cases. The proportion of underreporting on deaths is lower. Our estimates suggest around one in three deaths are being reported. Deaths appear to be lower on the continent in part because of the predominantly younger and more active population. With limited testing, we're still flying blind in far too many communities in Africa. Most tests are carried out on people with symptoms, but much of the transmission is driven by asymptomatic people. Estimates suggest that between 65 and 85% of COVID-19 cases are asymptomatic. The reported cases we see could therefore just be the tip of the iceberg. In tracking how many countries meet WHO's recommendation 
of 10 tests per 10,000 people each week, consistently around 20 countries, more than a third of African countries, do not reach this benchmark. Now is the time to go on the offensive against COVID-19 to address these testing challenges. WHO's new community testing initiative is a radically new approach which shifts from passive to active surveillance through working with communities. Local authorities and hotspot districts will use antigen detection rapid diagnostic tests, which are reliable, affordable, easy to use, and provide results in around 15 minutes so that individuals can quickly know their status. Using a ring-based testing strategy, all individuals living within a hundred meter radius of a case will be eligible for voluntary testing. To kick off implementation, WHO has provided funds to eight countries participating in the initial pilot program. Experts have also been deployed to countries to start the operations. It's expected that more than 7 million people will be tested through this new initiative, increasing the testing capacity in each participating country by 40%. An additional 360,000 cases are anticipated to be detected with around 75% being asymptomatic or mild cases eligible for home-based care. Ramping up testing in this way will help us to quickly contain future flare-ups of COVID-19 by breaking chains of transmission. As societies start looking towards a post-pandemic future, this community testing strategy is a key component in transitioning towards localized management of COVID-19 outbreaks. This is an outbreak that we'd like to be adopted more broadly and lessons from this project will be shared so that countries can adopt it to their specific context. I also want to mention that COVID-19 is not the only outbreak rattling the continent at present. The Democratic Republic of the Congo has announced a resurgence of Ebola in North Kivu province. There are now two confirmed cases of Ebola. Both people have unfortunately died. Initial genomic sequencing indicates that the new cases likely represent a new flare up of the 2018 to 2020 Ebola outbreak, most likely transmitted by a persistently infected survivor or a survivor who is experiencing a relapse. WHO experts are on the ground supporting local authorities with contact tracing, surveillance, testing, and vaccination, which began yesterday in Beni. 14 people were vaccinated on the first day. More than 220 contacts have been identified and teams are monitoring their health. In closing, the recognition that there are millions of undetected COVID-19 cases in Africa makes even more urgent the need to speed up access to vaccines. End of year celebrations are fast approaching. And we saw last year that intense travel and gathering in December led to a surge in cases. So countries should be preparing now for a fourth possible wave. As WHO, we are providing support to reinforce community engagement surveillance, case management, and other critical capacities. We are also urgently urging wealthy countries, most of whom have vaccinated two thirds of their populations to share significant doses of vaccines now rather than next year. Finally, for all of us to be able to reconnect with family and friends in the way we would like after this incredibly difficult year and a half, I encourage everyone to get vaccinated as soon as you have the opportunity to do so and to keep up the preventive measures. I look forward very much to our discussion with my fellow panelists today. And I thank you once again for having joined us. Thank you very much, Dr. Moeti. And now to you, Dr. Tambu. Please uh, tell us how this community-based testing initiative that Senegal is part of can help the response. Uh, bonjour. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci donc à l'OMS, la directrice. 
Pasi Umatande. Hello? Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Et merci donc à la directrice à l'OMS. Donc, euh, vous remercions pour euh, cette belle initiative. Euh, en tout cas, par rapport à ce projet au niveau du Sénégal, donc, euh, nous sommes bien lancés donc, dans ce projet de recherche active euh, des cas asymptomatiques ou possibles autour des cas confirmés. Et donc, ce projet concerne pour le moment quatre districts. Ce sont les districts où il y a le plus de cas confirmés, qui sont donc les districts centre, le district sud, le district ouest et le district nord. Et au niveau de ces districts, donc après l'entretien avec euh, les MCD, les médecins chefs de district, donc des équipes sont mises en place, on a appelé des équipes de recherche. Et donc c'est ces équipes-là qui vont donc aller sur le terrain et au niveau de la communauté pour donc la mise en œuvre de ces activités de dépistage qui viennent à, au bon moment parce qu'on sait que avec la baisse des cas, c'est toujours donc un peu le relâchement. Et pour éviter en tout cas la résurgence, euh, Madame la directrice a parlé de quatrième vague. En tout cas, nous nous touchons du bois, en tout cas, pour qu'au niveau du Sénégal, on ne puisse pas avoir ce, ce rebond qui nous amènerait vers cette quatrième vague. Et nous comptons sur ce projet, en tout cas, pour éviter cette quatrième vague, en allant directement donc, au niveau communautaire, rechercher les cas possibles ou asymptomatiques et les amener dans le couloir de la prise en charge. Euh, nous en sommes à ce niveau, donc euh, on est en train de former les équipes de recherche. Et bien entendu, il faudra que ça soit accompagné d'une bonne communication avec le SNEPS et les EPS des districts. Et voilà où nous en sommes. Et voilà, nous allons espérer en tout cas que cette, euh, ce projet nous permettra d'éviter cette cette, cette, cette -là. Voilà donc ce que j'avais à dire pour le moment par rapport à cet important projet. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Tam. And now, Dr. Ngozi, can you please tell us about the importance of boosting testing capacity and how we can use RDTs to achieve this? Yes, thank you, Dr. Stella. Thank you, Madam Regional Director. So when COVID first hit, as uh, Dr. Mawadi has said, um, you know, African countries very much found them, and many countries around the world found themselves playing catch up, putting out fires. RDTs allow us to get ahead of COVID. Um, I think the problem when um, COVID first hit is that many African countries were flooded with poor quality RDTs. And so that has resulted in many people having a distrust in RDTs. Um, but RDTs really are the only way to have accessible, reliable, and affordable um, widespread testing uh, for COVID-19. And we have um, two WHO-approved RDTs, um, rapid diagnostic tests, that have very good performance. And so RDTs help communities to get on top of COVID by providing more uh, data for local decision making. As soon as we hear community transmission, transmission we start to fear the very real risk um, of having the health system overwhelmed. And then we need to introduce widespread measures um, that really limit, um, that help us to limit the potential for widespread disease. And for many of us, we know that this means lockdowns, it means movement restrictions, it means closing public areas. Um, and while this has been necessary, it has also been disastrous um, as far as economic uh, consequences across the continent. So having RDTs, uh, RDT testing closer to the community means that we have the ability to have more individuals tested um, and traced. RDTs can be easily transported to high density urban suburbs, but I'm sorry, or neighborhoods, but also to the most remote and rural areas. Um, testing more people tells us where the virus has gotten to. And then community data will help us to detect specific districts um, or villages that are having an uptake in cases um, or are having active outbreaks. So this means that the health authorities, the local health authorities are able to use the information not to close down entire towns, but maybe to make a decision about maybe a specific event. Um, like Dr. Moedi said, you know, maybe there's like a, a large holiday gathering um, that may need to be postponed or changed um, based on uh, the current COVID situation. And so this means that people who work in public facing positions like doctors, nurses, waitresses, um, business people, they also can have more assurance because there'll be more testing available to them. And I just wanted to end that RDTs are not new. Um, 
they are actually widespread in Africa, especially in endemic um, malaria in countries that have endemic malaria. Um, rapid diagnostic tests have been used in malaria as far back as the 1990s. Um, and WHO then also facilitated you know, evaluations to ensure RDT effectiveness. And so today it's lauded as one of the most effective advancements in malaria testing. Um, and it's the reason why the 2012 uh, test treat and track initiative was developed. And because of that initiative, you know, there have been community polls to, uh, to test and, and treat uh, malaria, you know, closer to the community, inside of the community. And that means we're able to diagnose malaria earlier and treat it earlier, um, disrupting transmission as well. So I, I think the strategy is very important. It's very needed. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the results um, of the pilot. Um, and I think more testing in Africa uh, will definitely help us get ahead of the COVID-19 situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngozi. So now that you have heard from all our panelists, it is time for you to ask your questions. To do this, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom platform. Tell us your name, the name of the media organization you represent, and let us know please to the Q&A function if you would like to go live. Still on hand to also help with answering our questions, uh, Dr. Richard Mihigo, who is the coordinator of uh, immunization and uh, vaccine development in the regional office. Dr. Fiona Braca, who is the emergency response team lead here at the regional office. And Dr. Tiano Balde, who is the deputy incident manager for the COVID-19 response. So we'll start, I'll start by asking um, a first, question that is offline. This question is from Sila from Gambia. Uh, I'll ask you first, uh, Dr. Moeti, and then the other panelists could uh, complement. The vaccine is in circulation. Uh, still, there are some people that are still refusing to take the injection. How safe are those who have been vaccinated but living in the midst of those who are not uh, vaccinated? And what is the lifespan of the dose or doses of the vaccine in the body. Okay, um, I, I think that um, first of all, we need to remember that uh, the, the vaccines are meant to reduce the spread of the virus. We know that they cannot stop it completely, but very importantly, the, the purpose of vaccinating people is to stop severe forms of the illness, meaning getting the hospitals, the health systems flooded with severely ill people and certainly to stop people dying. Uh, so we know also that the vaccines that have been emergency use licensed by WHO, by the scientific communities and the regulatory bodies of various countries are both effective in reducing transmission, in stopping severe illness, and they are safe. I think that is now very well established. So we would like to assure those who are still refusing to take the vaccine and being very well aware that not only are people fearful for one reason or another, there's some history in terms of some of the communication around vaccines, but there is in some quarters some active miscommunication about the vaccine, making people be afraid of various side effects. Women will no longer be able to have children. Men will no longer be able to do something or other. People will be made ill. Just to reassure people that once the vaccines are emergency licensed, these are safe and effective vaccines. And when, when people have been vaccinated, of course, they are the ones who are not only uh, sparing themselves from getting severely ill, but they're also reducing the chain of transmission to other people who are not themselves uh, infected. So really being vaccinated is a service, not only to yourself, but to your family, but also to your community. We would like to reach a level of vaccination that very severely, seriously slows down the spread of this vaccine. The vaccines are new and we are, there's a lot of discussion now, as you are very well aware, about the need for booster doses after some months, some months after people have been vaccinated. So there are some countries where these booster doses are starting to be provided for people at the most vulnerable 
um, stages of life who are either elderly people or have illnesses that make them liable to become severely ill and to have a higher risk of dying. Uh, so certainly as, uh, as new vaccines, there is data still being collected, how many months the effectiveness of this vaccine lasts. I, I think that when people have been vaccinated, they are less at risk from those who are unvaccinated. But what we would like is to see all people doing their best to protect one another by themselves getting vaccinated. So for me, the key message is to say, we have vaccines that are safe, we have vaccines that are effective. They particularly stop you getting seriously ill, but they also stop you being able to spread the virus among other people in your community. When you have been vaccinated, uh, you are doing your duty to your family, to your community, and to your country, and that um, at some point we will be able to determine who exactly needs a booster vaccine. It's at the moment being provided for people who have compromised immune system, meaning they're the most vulnerable to get serious illnesses because some of them have illnesses like cancer, uh, et cetera. Uh, so bottom line, please get vaccinated. Uh, you protect yourself, you protect your family, you protect your community, you protect your country, including its economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moeti. Um, uh, Paul, I understand you would like to go live with your question. Can you please ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I have, I have two questions. Uh, the first question uh, has to do with on the logistics of COVID-19 vaccination in Africa. Uh, personally, I got my first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine uh, in Nigeria and the second dose uh, here in the UK. And the experiences are quite different. And it begs the question of what contributions, uh, logistical challenges contributing to people being unable to get vaccinated. For instance, in Nigeria, you have to register online, then get as early as possible, sometimes spending lots of hours before receiving the shots. I want to know whether the WHO is making, uh, is working with African countries uh, to streamline the process. And I think uh, I would also like to have the experience of Senegal, what Senegal is doing to ensure that the process of receiving the vaccine shots is very easy for the people. What the second question I have regarding uh, RDTs and um, testing has be, since become uh, a very capital intensive uh, uh, project and initiative across the world, especially for international travelers. I want to know what is needed for WHO to recommend our duties for international travels. We've had cases where somebody would test negative before leaving a country and on point of arrival, uh, the local, the new country, the testing in the new country will now say the person has tested positive. And this will now bring controversies and lack of trust. But with low cost RDTs, since lots of money will not be involved, it could be much easier for international travelers to know that this is no longer a money leading venture. So what is being done uh, to ensure what level, what will be the threshold, what needs to happen for the WHO and other countries and countries across Africa to recommend our duties for international travel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for these questions. Uh, Dr. Moeti, I'll start with you. Um, Richard, please, you can compliment and the question uh, from on Senegal for Dr. Samdu to come in. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, so just starting on the question on uh, or your, your observations about the challenges of the logistics of uh, COVID-19 vaccine vaccination for people starting with registering online. Um, I think it is true that there's been some challenges encountered, but what, what I think has happened is that the first round of vaccines, the early vaccination rounds and the um, after action reviews that have been carried out by a number of countries have enabled the learning of a lot of lessons. Uh, I think we did see at the beginning, the assumption that many people would be able to register online. Uh, we know, however, that there is a significant gap in terms of access to connectivity, access to the internet in our communities in Africa. And what we have seen is these strategies evolve following the, the observations that particularly the initial groups that were being targeted, you know, elderly people, people with, um, with, with comorbidities, 
may not necessarily be the most connected people. We know that the most connected group is probably urban people, urban younger people in Africa. Many countries have started to diversify how people get registered and have done much more of an outreach to where they expect people to be connected in communities. We've seen countries contact people through their churches, through their associations, through their workplaces and expand rapidly the registration of people. There is no doubt that, um, and, and as WHO, what we have done is support the countries in developing their initial plans and strategies. And now in preparation for the second round and subsequent dosing, we have reviewed the strategies and, and advised the countries how to adapt them based on what has been learned. Well, what I can say is that we need to diversify very much the means by which people get registered based on the local realities and make it be very flexible about where we set up sites for vaccination as well. You know, of course, expecting people to come to vaccination sites, but I've seen countries also reach out and establish uh, vaccination services where they know that people gather and congregate. So this is a continuous learning process. And the idea is very much to accelerate as much as possible the number of people who do get registered and those who do get uh, vaccinated with minimal effort and, um, and challenges for those who are getting vaccinated. So I, I leave my response there and uh, ask one of my colleagues to respond on what is being done, what, what is WHO contemplating in, in, in terms of recommending RDTs for travelers? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moeti. Uh, Dr. Richard, do you want to compliment? Well, I think uh, Dr. Mwetep said it very nicely, uh, everything. Uh, just what, what I want to add is the, um, on top of uh, what you just very eloquently mentioned, uh, now the focus we are trying to see how to better support country to streamline vaccination against COVID within the system. Uh, and we have seen some countries that have taken quite very good step in trying to make the vaccine available at all level of the uh, districts. Um, and not necessarily concentrating the vaccination in the major urban centers, as we have seen at the beginning, uh, really deploying the vaccine in all the districts, making sure that people can get uh, vaccinated through their uh, regular um, uh, routine immunization platforms uh, that have been established in the health facility at district level. So the issue of registration indeed has been a, um, a, a discussion from the beginning. Um, and I think uh, uh, countries are taking a sort of a dual approach where online registration can be uh, facilitated, it's being done, but we have seen that in other places, uh, countries are using a sort of a manual process, uh, particularly in the district where also uh, uh, people can keep the record for those who have been vaccinated. But I think this is an area that we will need to continue to support countries. Um, as uh, we are increasing the number of people who have, uh, and the sites of the people who are, are getting vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard. And Dr. Samdu, there was a question on, on Senegal and uh, access to vaccines. Do you want to weigh in on that? Well, um, uh, merci. Euh, donc pour le Sénégal, euh, par rapport à la nation, ce qui fait qu'il n'y euh, a pas eu de grosse, euh, en tout cas, difficulté pour la C'est d'abord un engagement politique parce que euh, au démarrage de cette vaccination, nous avons vu, donc, euh, Monsieur le Président de la République, même si c'est fait dans d'autres pays, ici, direct, avec l'ensemble des, des ministres à la télé, c'était le transmet direct. Ensuite, il y a eu des autorités étatiques euh, avec des gouverneurs, les préfets qui ont fait de même au niveau de leur euh, zone de responsabilité. Les religieux également sont entrés dans la danse avec donc, cette vaccination au vu aussi de tout le monde. Euh, au niveau proximité également, les districts ont mené d'importantes campagnes de sensibilisation, de proximité, en faisant des caravanes, en faisant des portes à portes expliquer un peu l'importance de cette vaccination. Et maintenant, en pratique, au niveau des stratégies, les utilisateurs les décisions ont en tout cas essayé de rapprocher l'activité vaccinale des, des populations. Merci. 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 Merci.
fréquenté, même en place donc, des, des équipes et toute la logistique et démarrer cette vaccination. Et ces sites étaient mobiles, si je prends par exemple de, de la capitale, c'était des sites qui étaient érigés de différentes places, comme la place de beaucoup de places publiques bien fréquentées, qui ont donc été érigées en site de vaccination. Ceci a de vaccination. de l'Église ont adopté plus ou moins la, la région de Dakar pour pouvoir nous faire vacciner un nombre assez important de personnes. Voilà un peu ce qui a été fait pour le Sénégal. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, And then uh, the last part of Paul's question, Dr. Tiano, on RDTs for travelers, please. Yeah, thank you, Mary, and uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, journalist. I think the, the there are some really clear indication of the use of the RDTs, and uh, WHO has some clear recommendation for using the RDT and also for using the PCR test. And in the context of definitely international travel for the moment, WHO is not recommending the use of the RDTs for making those tests. However, where we have like, uh, where we wanted to monitor situation, COVID-19, the evolution of COVID-19 situation in kind of specific communities where the outbreak, where cases has already been confirmed with the test, with the PCR test, therefore we can use the RDTs. So there are definitely clear recommendations for the use or non-use of the RDTs. So it's this has been used properly, I mean, for specific purposes, as Dr. Moiti mentioned, really for trying to have a broader picture of the level of uh, infection in our in our continent here. But for the travels, I mean, especially for the international travel, given all of the different uh, impacts, the uh, implications of these ones, definitely for the moment, the WHO is uh, uh, recommending the use of the PCR test. Thank you, and I hope this clarifies. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baude, for that uh, clarification. And uh, our next question is from Aena from Rutas. This question is coming to you first, uh, Dr. Richard, and then uh, Dr. Moeti could weigh in, and uh, Dr. Ngozi as well. So he saying Moderna CEO earlier this week said that the comp company found it more efficient to expand their own production of the vaccine rather than to share their own uh, recipe. What is your comment on this? And are you optimistic about breaking the WTO deadlock over the TRIPS waiver, why or why not? Dr. Richard, please. Well, no, thank you, uh, uh, Mary, for the question. I, I think if you looked at the numbers uh, that we have now, I think uh, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to, um, um, to understand and um, uh, to, that, that statement because as of today, we have more than 6.5 billion doses uh, that have been administered glo globally. And um, um, in Africa, we have only 220 something, 225 million doses only, which has, uh, have arrived in, 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 the, in the region. So when we are talking about the availability of the vaccine on the continent, this is not a myth, it is a reality. There is not enough vaccines uh, for the simple reason that um, uh, either through COVAX or even through AVAT, uh, these two platforms that were supposed to provide vaccine to a country in this region, are not prioritized because of the uh, uh, vaccines producer, manufacturer that are mainly uh, uh, prioritizing high income countries and sometimes countries that have even vaccinating uh, uh, the large proportion of their population that we have heard uh, in the introductory remarks from uh, Dr. Moiti. So uh, the, the true deficit of supply, really it, it's, it's a reality on the ground. And the sooner we'll have enough capacity of production on the, on the uh, continent, I think we will we, we, we'll help really to bridge this gap. The, the other point I can add on this, the, I, I think we, we need also to have a mid to long-term uh, vision when it comes to vaccine independence on this region. 99% of the vaccine that are currently being used, I think uh, in Africa are manufactured outside. And we have learned, unfortunately, the, the, the hard way how vulnerable this continent is when it comes to supply on vaccines uh, uh, to this pandemic. So the, the sooner we'll have enough capacity on the continent uh, to produce locally the vaccines, I think the better for the health security of this region 
the health security of the people on, on the region. So we still believe that it's very important to have that capacity installed in this region. Now, the TRIPS agreement, um, I think there is a sort of a global consensus that, that uh, in the um, time of pandemic, I think we need absolutely to revisit some of these agreements to make sure that uh, uh, we can save lives. Because uh, as we are talking, uh, uh, the fact that vaccines are not deployed in the country, people are still continuing to get the disease, people are dying, uh, healthcare workers who are on the front line cannot be protected. So I think uh, uh, this consideration needs definitely to be uh, put uh, forward. And the more and more countries are coming uh, towards a conclusion that this has to be addressed as soon as possible. So thank you, uh, Mary. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Dr. Moretti, do you want to weigh in on this? Yes, thanks. Just briefly, I, I mean, it, it's basically to agree with uh, what Richard has said. I, I also would like to say that, you know, with, with the kind of delays we've seen in and the differences in coverage with the second dose that we're seeing in Africa compared to, to other regions, the continent has already suffered a, a, a significant delay in getting access to the vaccines. We now have Afri African governments very clearly stating their determination to change the situation, not only now, but also going into the future. So we would like to respectfully recommend to partners to partner with them. This is a rare moment. You know, the political commitment in terms of its fir firmness, including the readiness of African leaders to go and look for some of the resources, look for partners to invest in the financing is, is, is unprecedented, I would say, having worked in the past on HIV where we had very similar issues in terms of access to antiretroviral therapy. And, and I think it's important to look to the long term, to look to delivering, to developing the capacity to produce not only this, but other vaccines into the future, thus creating a market as well for those vaccines in, on the continent. Um, so I would also like to urge a rethink and a consideration of this medium to longer term view and, and uh, leveraging the kind of momentum that is going on at the political level at the technical and scientific level and build the capacity in Africa as well. For me, this would be a real sign of partnership with African countries, with African people for now and going into the future. And, and as Richard said, to affect other health problems. And I do think we need, when we have a situation like a pandemic that has had such a, a devastating impact on the world in different ways, health-wise, the deaths, economies, and futures, we should remember that for our countries in Africa, the impact is not going to be uh, overcome tomorrow. This may, it's going to last for some years that we do actually at some point need to be prepared to take that step of sharing technology in the way that has been recommended and advocated for if, if we really want to act in a way that's um, empathetic, but still continue, I believe, for, for companies to recoup their investments and make their profits. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moeti. Dr. Ngozi, your thoughts on this, please. Yes, thank you. I don't have too much more to add because I think uh, Dr. Moeti and uh, Dr. Mihigor really, um, I think, captured the need um, of vaccines as well as vaccine production on the continent. Though I am excited about um, the advances that the African Union and um, different partners have made as far as making a vaccine produ uh, production on the continent a reality. I mean, I think when it comes to Moderna, it's just really important to realize that this specific vaccine um, could be such a powerful um, game changer in Africa because um, this vaccine is more, it's easier to tweak. So as we get more variants, uh, because we have longer time of people not being vaccinated on the continent and elsewhere, um, this is a vaccine that could be very useful. Um, and so it, it really is um, abhorrent that so many beyond the, beyond the company itself, not sharing its um, intellectual uh, property or you know doing the tech transfer that's needed uh, to share the information. But there are many um, very uh, influential countries um, that have not uh, signed on to the TRIPS waiver or actually blocked the TRIPS wa waiver. So this is a larger issue that you know we keep talking about vaccine donations and we keep talking about sharing vaccines, but that is not a sustainable solution. Um, it's also very logistically logistically challenging. Um, and so I think you know 
just emphasizing the need for the TRIPS waiver to uh, to go forward for many, many countries that haven't signed up yet. I think that's that's something that I would just add to the conversation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngozi. The next question is uh, coming to you, uh, Dr. Baude. This question is from uh, Geoffrey from the Globe and Mail Canada. Can you explain the estimated 75% asymptomatic rate uh, in Africa of COVID cases? This seems to be higher than other parts of the world. Can you comment on the possible reasons? Is this because of the demographics or other reasons? And then there was uh, a second question on uh, how much WHO is providing for the community-based testing initiative to countries from Bloomberg. Dr. Tiano, please. Uh, thank you, Mary, and thanks for the question. So yes, uh, the, the first factor, I think Dr. Moiti have highlighted it. I mean, it's the younger population, younger and active population in our region. This is one uh, factor which might explain the situation of having 75% of asymptomatic cases in uh, Africa. The second reason is also definitely uh, the low level of the presence, I mean, the older diseases, I mean, uh, which are uh, factors of comorbidity of uh, the COVID-19. This is also something I mean, the low prevalence of diabetes, you know, hypertension and cancer within our population, which can also, I mean, make our, our people more probably resilient, I mean, to this virus. That's the second factor. And uh, the third factor also, we might think there are some hypotheses mentioning the existence, you know, of many older infectious, I mean, diseases, I mean, due to viruses and probably uh, viruses linked to like the, the, the coronaviruses where probably, you know, some of the Africans have been exposed you know, over the years. And uh, this might be also another factor which might explain also the current situation. We know that in our region, I mean, there are many other uh, outbreaks due, due to infectious diseases, so which might explain also the situation. So those are the two reasons currently that we have uh, currently in mind, I mean, for explaining this situation. About uh, the amount of the, the, the for the, this uh, pilot project, for the moment, we have invested uh, about 1.8 million uh, for covering the these eight countries where the project is being implemented. And obviously, uh, based on the result and also the, uh, the effect and the impact of this project, we are looking at really scaling scaling up the implementation in uh, uh, more other uh, countries in the region here. Thank you, Enova. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Balde. Um, this question is coming to you first, uh, Dr. Moeti and uh, Dr. Ngozi could uh, weigh in as well. So it's a long question. I'll just uh, break it down. Cases of COVID-19 have significantly decreased here in Africa. Is the pandemic disappearing? Then at the same time, COVID vaccine debates are still ongoing. With this decrease, do we still have to insist on awareness campaigns? So Dr. Moeti, you first. And then uh, Dr. Ngozi could compliment, then I'll come to Dr. Richard with the second part of the question. Um, yes, thank you for that, that question. So cases have decreased. We've been here before. We, we've had waves of cases going up and cases going down. It, it all depends on what's happening. It, and it happens at different times for different reasons in, the, in, in different settings, uh, cities, uh, provinces and countries. And what, what we know is that very likely there will be cases going up again. At the moment, cases are going down in most countries, but we see them going up in some other countries as well at the same time. So I think we cannot say that the pandemic is disappearing, but not by any means. And as I said in my remarks, we can probably anticipate that there'll be a wave of cases going up at the end of the year, because that's when people have a break for the festive season, they go home, they gather and uh, travel. And, and as the situation where we are now with the level of vaccination relatively low and the situation also of the fact that in many places, uh, people are tired of the prevention measures. You know, there's a need to re-engage them on sustaining the use of masks when you are going to be in contact with people, keeping a distance, uh, those, those public health measures that we have talked about many times. So that combination of factors, we believe, and the fact that um, there are variants emerging all the time. And some of the variants we have seen 
are more liable to, there are more infectious, if you like, uh, one person can infect more people than others. So as long as we are in a condition, in a situation where the vaccination rates are relatively low, uh, public health measures, preventive measures are needing to be reinforced. And uh, we have events coming, uh, happily the events we can look forward and predict to some degree and reinforce ahead of the time, the things like uh, this community-based testing using uh, rapid, rapid diagnostic tests. So I believe we increasingly have the tools at our disposal and this initiative we're talking about today will be a very important uh, possible way of preventing or being able to, to contain an upward surge that we are absolutely expecting towards the, the end of the year during the course of the festive season. So we are not at all uh, seeing the pandemic disappearing and we must work very hard to get the vaccination rates up, very hard to get our knowledge at the local level of where the virus is circulating and then to reinforce the prevention measures. Thank you, Dr. Moeti. Dr. Ngozi, your thoughts, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, Dr. Moeti has, I think, covered all the points on COVID in particular. Um, and I th the only thing I would add is that, you know, there's a lot of diseases everywhere, especially um, that we're fighting in Africa, throughout Africa. Um, you know, I brought up malaria earlier when I was talking about, you know, RDTs not being something that's new. Um, you know, endemic diseases are not new either, yet no one is happy with, you know, that there's still 230 million cases of malaria on the continent or, or across the world. And almost 70% of those cases are children um, or who die from malaria are children under five. I think anybody who had a child or a loved one who died of malaria or who died of COVID, um, it wouldn't be good enough to just, you know, say, you know, it's re cases are reducing, let's stop talking about it. Um, and to add to Dr. Moedi's point about vaccination, we know that vaccines that have been introduced across the world have really prevented um, many COVID deaths. One estimate from the US in particular is that 140,000 deaths so far have been um, averted due to the introduction of COVID vaccines. So, you know, COVID still is an issue. It, it's this, this virus, while it's an, a family of viruses that we're aware of, it's something that is really new to the um, to to human beings. And so while we have unpredicted issues such as um, our, our, of variants, there, there are even more challenges that may come about that we're not aware of yet. And so the best thing to do is to keep the awareness there, to in introduce um, more widespread testing and to increase um, vaccination uptake rates and the accessibility and availability of vaccines as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngozi. And the last part of the question, uh, Dr. Richard, what can you say about the after effects of COVID vaccines? Do they differ by vaccine types? Well, um, I think we, we are now more and more um, getting uh, uh, information on the uh, uh, effect of these vaccines. I think as uh, uh, the vaccine has been rolled out, the pharmacovigilance system has been strengthened in most of the country. We are seeing in vast majority, at least for those vaccines that have received the WHO emergency use listing authorization, that the uh, uh, um, side effects are mild. Are mild. It's, um, and those have been normally um, uh, documented in any vaccination, um, some pain at the point of injection, mild fever. That's usually disappear um, in uh, the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. So um, uh, the safety profile of the vaccine now has been very strongly established. Um, and uh, we are monitoring quite seriously any other adverse event. So we can say for sure that uh, for, for the moment, most of these vaccines are very safe. The uh, side effects are very mild. And, and again, to strong, strongly encourage people to uh, uh, get protected and immunized against this disease. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard. Um, we have the next question, uh, and I'm going to pass it to uh, Dr. Samdu first, and then uh, the remaining panelists could also weigh in on this question. This question is from Le Monde, uh, from Catherine. I would like to know about the implementation of other public health and social measures like uh, social distancing communication. In which country are they being implemented? 
what are their effects on the control of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the compliance of the population. So let's start uh, with colleagues from the countries, Dr. Samdu, and then Dr. Ngozi and Dr. Moeti can weigh in finally. Dr. Samdu, please. Okay, can I start with you, Dr. Ngozi, then? Yeah, sure. Um, just look at the, I, I heard the question, but I just want to read it again. Actually, okay. could you read the question one more time, if that's okay? Yes, I'll, I'll read the question again. Uh, Catherine from Le Monde is saying uh, she would like to know more about uh, the implementation of public health and social measures. What countries are they being implemented and uh, what do we think about the compliance of the general population? So you can bring in the, the perspectives from, from Nigeria and any other country that you know about. Well, I'll, I'll probably bring in the perspectives from kind of the earlier part of the outbreak that I was more active in when pretty much all the countries across Africa did uh, implement some type of public health or social measure um, uh, to re restrict movement um, in order to um, stop the transmit or to to slow down the transmission of the virus. Um, and since the beginning of the pandemic, we've had several studies that have really looked at, you know, social distancing, mask wearing, um, curfews, shutdowns, and really what, what has come in, what is shown is to be really effective is some type of combination of those things, um, then an effective package of several so, um, public health and social measures um, put in place uh, where it was able to reduce the spread of COVID-19 or um, stem it for a while. And there's a, there's a study across South America in particular that showed that even as the, um, even as the, um, sorry, the, the pandemic progressed, people who were, countries that were able to implement measures earlier consistently with higher adherence were, were, were able to see a slower, slower time. So uh, for, you know, if, we, if we're looking at the, um, the RT, that, that was much lower compared to countries that weren't able to do the earlier measures. So I, I would say just the combination of the public health measures are, are very useful, but obviously it needs to be early um, implemented and there needs to be high adherence. And like Dr. Moeti said earlier, I think the challenge is that people are tired. You know, we're on year two of this pandemic. And so continuing to do those type of measures besides the mask wearing and the social distancing when needed, the, the larger, more extreme uh, measures is really effective, are really, um, is really ineffective right now because people are not adhering as much because of just pandemic fatigue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. So I come back to you, Dr. Samdu. Do you want to bring in the perspective from Senegal? How did you implement the public health and social measures? Was it effective in your response? And was the population compliant? Voilà, merci. Donc, euh, au Sénégal, donc, par rapport aux mesures de, de prévention, on est passé par différentes mesures allant donc euh, du couvre-feu jusqu'aux mesures les plus récentes. C'est vrai qu'il y a une certaine lassitude, mais présentement, les mesures en tout cas les plus utilisées, en tout cas sur lesquelles pratiquement les populations en tout cas continuent de respecter, c'est le port de masque qui est même obligatoire dans certains endroits et l'utilisation du gel. En tout cas, ces deux mesures jusqu'à présent quel que soit par ailleurs le niveau de l'assitude constaté au niveau de la population, quand même, ils continuent à mettre leur masque et à avoir le gel à côté. Maintenant, pour l'apport par rapport à la distanciation, c'est un peu difficile parce que c'était préconisé au niveau de certains lieux de regroupement et au niveau de, de, de moyens de transport, mais quand même... Le respect quand même n'est pas, pas strict et plus ou moins même, on peut dire que cette mesure de distanciation est maintenant n'est plus à l'ordre du jour. Ce que les gens, en tout cas, toujours demandent de, de, de faire, c'est le respect du port du masque qui est obligatoire dans certains lieux et également donc, euh, avoir son gel euh, qui est même aussi présent au niveau de certains, certains lieux ou certains établissements recevant le public. 
Donc, nous en sommes actuellement à ces deux mesures, mais pour le reste, c'est plus ou moins à l'ordre avec vraiment la, la fatigue mmh. ou le relâchement en tout cas constaté et qui va surtout avec donc la baisse du, du nombre de cas. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Sandu. And uh, Dr. Moeti, do you want to weigh in on the implementation of the public health and social measures on the continent? Um, yes, well, I agree very much uh, with Dr. Ngozi and Dr. Tambi, uh, what, what they have said. I, I think that what we have learned is that um, there need to be a sustained or sustained communication encouragement of people to continue to do their part as far as the, the these uh, measures are concerned. So uh, my observation is that when the communication is done through trusted sources, of course, through officials, through people in WHO, through scientists is very important, but it's equally important that it should be people with whom uh, community members are communicating in whom they have trust, who can be continuing this encouragement and uh, urging people to do their best to, to make their own contribution. And I do think what we've learned as well is we need to understand the context in which people are living and in order to be able to support them to do their part. So clearly we've seen that in places like markets, even in the open and where we know that uh, people are living in households where there is uh, crowding in the family household. And I think we need to acknowledge that some of these measures are difficult and try to emphasize those that are fe feasible, encourage people through information, uh, through those in whom they have trust and support them to be able to carry out some of these measures. Uh, I do believe that uh, in some countries there have been attempts to make sure that people have access to masks, uh, people have access to water, for the hygiene measures, sometimes our people are living in urban areas in, in situations where they don't easily have access to water and they have to decide whether to use the water they obtain for hand washing or for cooking and drinking in the house. So I think we need to be very well aware of the local situation and it is up to governments and partners like ourselves to see how to support members of the community in order to contribute their part. What this says to me at this moment is that, yes, we must uh, continue to discourage large gatherings and, and help those who are leading in some of these activities, um, political campaigns. We've had elections in countries, religious gatherings continue to be uh, a challenge as far as this is concerned. And then at the end of the day, we really need to get hold of vaccines and vaccine and vaccinate African people as a way of getting out of this situation. And again, just to reiterate as individuals, when we have the chance, we must get vaccinated to contribute to this normalization as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moeti. We all have a responsibility as individuals. Please let's get vaccinated when our turn comes. Uh, Dr. Richard, um, this question is from Kerry, uh, Policy Watch Geneva and South Africa. The question is, yesterday, Dr. Tedros indicated that Burundi and Eritrea haven't started uh, vaccinating against COVID-19. Can you explain what the barriers are and what is being done to address uh, these barriers? And then the second question from the same journalist, I'm giving it to Dr. Tiano Balde. How did WHO reach uh, the figure that African COVID deaths are three times higher and cases seven times higher. So I start with you, Dr. Richard, and then uh, Dr. Tiano. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Mary. So yes, Burundi and the Eritrea were so far the, the, the only two countries that have yet to uh, start uh, vaccination at a larger scale. WHO, since day one, uh, continued calls to work with national authorities to advocate for um, uh, uh, not only vaccination, but uh, overall uh, support for COVID response in those two countries. So we have, uh, through our WHO our country office, our WHO representative teams that are in those countries supporting national authority in the overall COVID response. And part of this work, we are uh, doing a lot of advocacy to, uh, for vaccination as well. So uh, Burundi has made quite some progress. Uh, we know that recently the country joined both 
um, the AVAT, the African Union uh, led uh, uh, initiative, but also sign all the agreement from COVAX. So Burundi should uh, put, uh, start vaccinating quite very soon uh, in the next few days uh, or weeks to come. Uh, so for Eritrea, um, um, I think we are still working with the, uh, the, the country. Um, and um, I, I think uh, we may see the uh, continue to the work through our country office there. Uh, the advocacy has been done through all level, the regional director, the director general, and I think uh, this is an ongoing work uh, that we are doing on top, indeed, uh, of already ongoing support that is being provided uh, to that country for the overall COVID response. Over. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Dr. Tiano. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mary. For doing this estimation, uh, I mean, uh, the, the golden standard initiate and conduct uh, seroprevalence studies within the population, within the entire population to know exactly, you know, the level of infection which uh, people has faced, I mean, over a certain period of time. So this is what has been conducted in few countries and then uh, there have been some extrapolation to the entire region. That's uh, how uh, we get these figures. And obviously this work is still ongoing uh, since, I mean, uh, this can take some time and uh, these studies have been uh, performed over the past, uh, I mean, one year and uh, definitely given the dynamic of the outbreak, we need still to continue this study. So it's based on seroprevalence studies, you know, to the to the entire population or sometimes to some of the targeted, I mean, the group of uh, the society where you can try really to know exactly the exact level of uh, uh, contamination or infection of the population. That's how we determine this uh, this number. And for the, for the lethality rate, uh, this is really also through the analysis and estimate of the excess of deaths which can be, I mean, performed during a certain period of time. This is what has been done notably for South Africa, for Seychelles, and that's how we get to these figures that we have just, uh, uh, which has been mentioned by, uh, by, the, by the regional director. Maybe a last contribution also onto these uh, measures on the, the, the public health and social measures. Uh, this initiative that has been, I mean, presented today has also that component. Dr. Moiti was saying, how can we really encourage people and to capacitate them, you know, in a really adopting these public health and social measures. So in addition to the detection, to the testing, there is also another component of action, you know, where we can try to get these kits, you know, made of uh, face masks, maybe local, I mean, made and washable masks, you know, which can be distributed to the people. Because when you encourage people for, 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 for adopting these measures, they need to be capacitated. In some, in, in some ways. So there is also that component where we can distribute and sensitize people and to give them this face mask, which can last maybe for some months, you know, which they can use. So this is one component also, which can help us, I mean, just to change uh, these uh, current dynamic. And obviously there was also the other component around the isolation of these cases. We know the context is difficult, but the home-based care uh, component in these initiatives is also there, including also the referral I mean, uh, for, for, the, for the cases which are uh, presenting some of the symptoms. So I think uh, the really beefing up and scaling of these community response actions can really help us a lot, I think, in, in halting or at least, you know, minimizing, I mean, the transmission within the communities. Thank you, Enova. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tiano. So we are now uh, coming back. We are coming to the end of uh, the press briefing for today. So we will go back to our panelists to give us their final thoughts, uh, one minute each. So I will start with uh, Dr. Samdu, then Dr. Ngozi, and then Dr. Moeti. Your final remarks, please. Voilà, merci. Donc, c'est vous remerciez. Et en tout cas, à ce stade de, de la pandémie, nous au Sénégal, nous avons une baisse. Tous les souhaits, en tout cas, tous les prieurs vont dans le sens qu'on ne puisse pas, en tout cas, parler de, de nouvelles vagues et qu'on s'en tienne à cette première vague. Et ce, avec donc l'appui de l'OMS, notamment de ce nouveau projet, en tout cas, avec lequel nous allons, nous osons espérer, en tout cas, que les résultats vont suivre et que, Inch'Allah, on s'arrêtera à cette vague et que la pandémie quitte, en tout cas, définitivement l'Afrique. Thank you very much, Dr. Sam. Dr. Ngozi, your final thoughts? 
Thank you so much. And thank you uh, to WHO for allowing me to be on this briefing today. My final thoughts are just that this new strategy to introduce more RDTs into the continent um, is a breath of fresh air. You know, RDTs cost are magnitudes lower than PCR. And while they cannot replace PCR, it's a very complementary um, strategy uh, to really help us to understand what is happening when it comes to COVID-19 in our, our countries across Africa. Um, so I, I very much welcome this pilot and I welcome the results that we'll learn from um, the countries that it's being tested in right now. Um, and I'm glad that during this call, we were, or during this briefing, we were ever also able to speak about vaccine inequity and specifically the TRIPS waiver. And I would just end with a push to more countries uh, to commit to that and to um, allow for tech transfer to the African country, or African region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ngozi. And finally, to you, Dr. Moeti. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, first, I'd like to really thank my fellow panelists, Dr. Tamdu and uh, Dr. Ngozi Arondu for having shared with us their perspective, their experiences. Uh, it was very valuable for us in WHO. I, I thank also our journalist colleagues for having, uh, for having joined us. And, and I, I can only conclude by echoing the fact that for me, the, um, the value as well of these uh, rapid uh, tests is that it will somewhat demystify this and enable people at the local level. Uh, healthcare workers in, with the challenges that we have in our national health systems and people in the community to feel that they have a tool that they are able to determine how to use themselves. So people, if people are well informed and the healthcare workers are able themselves to use this to whatever their level of skill, because we, we see that these RDTs are very uh, versatile and, and flexible. I believe this is what we need to decentralize what happens around in, in interventions, knowledge, a feeling of confidence in our healthcare system so that people at the local level, healthcare workers at the local level can take action that can have a local impact without the kind of drastic measures that we needed, which are going to cost us a lot going into the future with, in, in addressing the pandemic. So I'm very excited to learn from this initial so-called pilot, and I'd like to see it rapidly expanding to be a normal way of addressing public health threats. And as Dr. Ngozi says, said, also applying this to other diseases, we drive very strongly, we urge very strongly decentralization of action, getting communities involved. And I think this is one experience that's going to enable us to learn and uh, also have impact with, with that approach. Thank you all for having joined us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moeti. So uh, I want to say a very big thanks to you first, Dr. Moeti, for always being here. And to all our panelists today, thank you for your insightful thoughts on the COVID-19 response and uh, expanding COVID-19 testing capacity, especially at the community level in our region. And a very big thanks to all our journalists that have been with us here through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic journey. Thanks for all the good work that everyone is doing. See you next week. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs>